everyone, and welcome to our second discussion about the films in the program of the Korean Film Week, A Century of Korean Women, hosted by the Embassy of the Republic of Korea and its cultural department. Thank you to all that are interested in this film and have decided to watch this panel. And thank you to those who are here today taking part in this discussion. So first we have Sanya Struna, a film critic from Slovenia who specializes in Korean cinema. Then we have two students of Korean studies joining us. Marsha Stix from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia and Rosemary Levy from the University of Vienna in Austria. I'm Alexandra Schifat and I'm a lecturer at the University of Vienna at the Department of Korean Studies. So the film we're going to talk about now is from 1975 and is titled Yongja's Heydays. It was written and directed by Kim Ho Son Son and was the fourth biggest box office hit of the 1970s in South Korea. Now to provide a bit of a backdrop for what happens in the movie, uh, South Korea has had one of the largest economic growths of the past 60 years. From a country with economy based in agriculture, which was in the 1960s, it now has one of the largest GDPs in the world. This is a miracle in a way, but it was built on the backs of generations. Right after the start of industrialization in the 1970s, many young wem, uh, men and women left the countryside to get jobs in Seoul. Instead of working towards a brighter future, many of them faced exploitation and were used in one way or another, leading grim lives as they worked themselves into the ground. Young Just Heydays, directed by Kim ho -san, tells a fictional story of a woman and a man from this time. Yongja works as a maid and Changsu works as a factory worker. Changsu is immediately drawn to Yongja, but she does not have the luxury to afford romance because earning money comes first. Even so, she promises to wait for him when he goes when he gets drafted and leaves for the Vietnam War. When he returns after three years and meets Yongja again, it is to a great shock on Changsu's part. Because once shy, Yongja has become a prostitute and her character and body have been marked by three merciless years. Thank you, Sanya. Uh, I would like to emphasize the overall usage of human bodies in the film, not only in terms of sexuality, but also in terms of physical work, sickness and mutilation. As we mentioned, the film is about Yongja's struggle and her fall into many traps, leading to a complicated, not so glamorous life of selling her body. We are following her melodramatic and tragic relationship with Jiang Su, when Sun Yatin is learning about the abhorrent material circumstances of lower class labor workers in Korea. And uh, this is where we can compare her job of being a prostitute with that of Chang Su, uh, who is a masseuse or a back scrubber. She works in a public house and he works in a public bath. They both have uh, male customers and are using their body to earn capital. Sexuality and the gendered notion of labor play an important role in the film, but we are also seeing a lot of a lot going on with bodies in general and their loss of subjectivity. Also later portrayal of sickness and diseased bodies reminds us that they are in fact neither machines nor, nor substitutes for machines. We can see a big conflict here. Um, I mean, in a society where bodies are measured by, by their productivity, as in capacity to earn capital, where What does it actually mean to have a body that can no longer work? Yongja's labor can make her sick, but how can she recover and why? To survive or to get sick again? I also think that uh, the usage of the ancient Greek sculpture of Aphrodite was very clever, since uh, she is a goddess of love and passion, adored by masses, and also a bit mutilated, missing her arms, but otherwise intact. Thank you, Masha. Um, speaking of um, visuals, um, an interesting aspect I would like to talk about 
is the use of colors and sound within Yongzhou's heydays, um, the main purpose of which seems to be drawing lines between the surreal or dreamlike segments and reality. For example, in scenes that require more focus on the physical, the voices, the voices of the on-screen characters are muted and we, the audience, are forced to focus more on the body language and facial expressions of the characters. Um, you can already see an example of this in just the opening scene of the movie, during which the prostitutes are protesting their arrest um, and being dragged to the police station. Um, during uh, a flashback or montage of Yongja's family back home in the countryside, um, they are, for example, portrayed in black and white, which stands out from the otherwise pretty colorful movie. Personally, I feel that this points to her old life now being a closed chapter, um, kind of a place that she can no longer return to. Um, or if you were to phrase it more dramatically, perhaps one could say it's a part of her that has died, which is hinted at several times throughout the movie when she mentions to Chang Su that she's no longer the same woman, a woman, sorry, <laughs> he once knew, and that she has forgotten everything that happened in, in her past. And um, another thing that I also think is quite interesting is um, Yongja is shown to wear clothes primarily in the colors red and yellow. Um, there are exceptions to this, but um, primarily those colors, which are quite bright and distinct. Um, and they seem to be the colors she's generally most comfortable with. Um, it also makes it easier for the viewer to spot her in a crowd when she's on the streets or in a room filled with people dressed in sort of more muted tones um, and as well sort of contrast the darker scenes in the movie um, by making her appearance brighter. Um, and this is even, I mean, the, the, the bright color aspect is also used in terms of her physical appearance um, with a red lipstick, um, which is used to suggest that uh, the scene involves promiscuity or a lack of modesty on her part. Um, and most of the segments in the movie that emphasize more on her former innocent self or her later more bashful, docile self, um, her reformed self, if you will, show her oftentimes almost entirely barefaced or with quite minimal amounts of makeup by comparison. Um, and it really serves to highlight the moments in her life involving uh, prostitution distinctly and gives the viewer a, a very obvious physical marker to, dis to distinguish between, um, let's say, the normal women and those that one might politely refer to as seas of the night. Thank you, Rosie. So that brings us to our next topic, the Hostess films. And as you probably know by now, Hostess was a euphemism for pro prostitutes in the Korean context of the 1970s and 80s. So in terms of genre, Young Just Heydays has been classified as part of the Hostess film genre. And these films, they usually depicted young girls from rural areas such as Yongja, migrating to this big city, in our case that's Seoul, and they're suffering from some sort of trauma along the way, also failed relationship with men, and eventually they become prostitutes. So Yongja's heydays was released in 1975 during the Park Chung-hee era. Park seized control of South Korea in 1961, and even from the early days of his rule, he was aware of the potential of films. So, of course, it didn't take a long time for him to acquire control over film production, distribution and exhibition. How did he do that? So, by setting up a series of laws and infrastructure. Part of this was the motion picture law. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Um, the Park regime removed all scenes or prohibited the exhibition of a film if it, 
if it was too indicative of poverty. So as Park's dictatorship became prolonged, the state censors were wary of depicting the current condition of society and politics. The rules were fairly simple. Poor people should not be shown in the streets of Seoul. Student demonstrations cannot be shown or even be implied and so on. However, in Hostess film such dangerously realistic portraits of lower life class and poverty survived censorship without amendments or without severe amendments or revisions. Many Hostess films take place in urban areas and even feature real life brothels and back alleys where prostitution was carried on. Now, let's pretend for a second that that same measure of censorship had been applied to Yongja's heydays. There wouldn't be much left to see. So, that's another thing. These films usually show existing sites of prostitution and we're not just talking some quick takes here, we're talking on location shootings and long takes. So, um, how come Hostess films survive the censorship of Park's military rule without severe amendments or revision? That's, well, that's actually a question that has been discussed at length because the Park regime's film censorship rules clearly representation of, quote, the activity of prostitution, rape, or illicit sex outside of marriage. So, some scholars argue that sexual content was exempt from the censorship practices in order to divert the public's attention away from political issues. And since the Korean film industry was suffering immensely during that time, some scholars would also argue that portraying women as sexual objects would probably lure back some. Yeah, and fun fact, Kim ho Sun, who is director of Young Just Hey Days, actually made a career for himself making success films. Another thing that is worth mentioning, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but on November 7th, this year, 2020, the actor who played Chang Su, Song Jae Ho, passed away. So, to the younger generation, he is probably best known as a supporting character in numerous TV dramas and films, including, of course, his role as the sergeant in Hong Jun Ho's movie Memories of Murder from 2003. Yes, and this concludes our discussion on Young Just Hey Days. Thank you, everyone here. And thank you all for watching. And if you are interested in more of our discussions, we'll publish them on the days the films are scheduled for screenings. And they will also be available after Korean Film Week. Thank you. Thank you.